Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast, a Canadian real estate podcast that shows you how to pay off your mortgage sooner and live well while doing it. Now, here's your host, Sean Cooper. Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. I'm Sean Cooper, and it's great to be back for another episode. On today's show, I'll be talking to Leanna Hawkins. Leanna's episode is the latest in a series of podcast shows on women in real estate. In the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing successful female real estate investors to help encourage and inspire more women to get into real estate. Leanna is a financial strategist and wellness expert, entrepreneur, and best-selling author. She founded her firm Blackhawk Financial in 2014 and has over 12 years of experience working alongside numerous funds, private, and public companies listed on multiple worldwide exchanges in various sectors including financial services, media, alternative assets, real estate, and clean tech. In my interview with Leanna, we discuss factors that come into play when deciding to sell your home, dealing with the sudden loss of a loved one, and the importance of building your real estate dream team. Without further ado, here's my interview with Leanna Hawkins. Hi, Leanna. How are you doing today? I'm great, Sean. How are you? Doing well, thanks. So looking forward to an interesting discussion on real estate as well as your personal story. Absolutely. Me as well. Great. Well, let's get started. Can you tell us why you were initially thinking of selling your condo, which had been profitable in both rental income and capital gains growth over the last nine years or so that you owned it? And what was your initial thought process like? Yes, I'd owned this place for very long. It was uh, the first property that I had owned since my uh, very early 20s, fresh out of college. And uh, there were some big changes happening um, in the rental market and in the overall uh, the Vancouver uh, real estate market where I'm from. Um, and this has been happening you know, across Canada with changes in the international buyer regulations. And I had just come back from um, quite a bit of time down in California. I had had a furnished renter in this unit for some time, which was, you know, on and off while I was living in in London, Toronto, and, you know, other places. And um, so I basically needed to get another furnished renter um, or renter of some kind or move back into it. And um, really, unfortunately, at the same time um, during that month when I had come back to figure this out and deal with this um, was the sudden passing of my long-term um, on and off partner, boyfriend. And um, that had also gone on for the exact same time as the ownership of this apartment. Um, and uh, so that grief was very sudden and it hit me really hard. And at the same time, I was kind of, you know, trying to deal with this condo and what was I going to do with it? And, you know, the market was expected to change very quickly. And this happens a lot with anyone when they're trying to make a decision about their home ownership, uh, whether it's a detached or an attached unit, like a condo or an apartment. And, you know, when you throw grief into that, you need to have one people around you that can help you make clear guided decisions. Um, and two, you need to go through that decision-making process um, with a list of plus and minuses and checks about what is going to be the best thing for you and, you know, where do you expect the market to go? And, you know, you really need to sit down and hopefully, again, have some people around you to guide you through that. And, you know, again, with um, that new change in my life and that person um, leaving my life, I was also then expecting to make a big move to New York sometime over the next six months or so. And so I had all these different things going on and I need to figure out what I was going to do. And I think the main part of it as well was that I was expecting a change in both the rental market 
and um, that I was going to have a big move. So those two things eventually did lead me to a couple weeks later list it for sale. Wow, that must have been quite shocking for your boyfriend to suddenly pass away like that. And I'm very sorry for your loss. I guess that really speaks to the point that you really need to be prepared for the unexpected when you're a homeowner, whether it's somebody passing away, a relationship ending, or even a big home repair that you're not expecting. But further to that point, can you talk to us about what other factors came into play in terms of your decision? Yeah. So, and you know, that's, it's a really good point because this comes into play for people all the time, you know, whether it's the loss of, you know, a person, whether it's a a parent, a spouse, a child, um, a friend, or just a major life change. And you don't want to be in that area anymore. You don't, you don't want to have those memories. And yeah, for me, I just, I didn't want to walk around that neighborhood anymore. I wanted a fresh start. Um, I had been planning on making a big move to another city. And this was definitely the the push to finally make that happen. And I was really excited for a fresh new start. But, you know, when something really sudden like this happens, and like you said, you know, when there's a, a major repair to happen in the home, like a new roof or something, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. Um, this is a personal finance lesson that you need to be prepared. And, you know, for example, um, this wasn't just, you know, I was on the lucky end of it where I had had, you know, major capital gains in the home. It had been profitable in terms of rentals for many years. Um, But if you were on the other end of that scope where the home wasn't profitable going into a sale um, and you wanted to move or you needed to go rent it right away because you needed to get out of that situation and you weren't going to be making money on it or you weren't going to be able to pay off the entire mortgage with that rental income. You need to have cash saved up or you need to have an emergency savings account to be able to front some of that money in the meantime. um, I, for example, um, was emotionally and mentally just completely out of it for a good few weeks. And that, yeah, I was still you know, answering emails and phone calls for my business as needed. Um, But, you know, these kind of things like sudden grief, like really takes a toll on you. So that's why just from a personal finance standpoint, when it comes to your real estate or, you know, anything that could hit you suddenly like that, it's really, really important to have three months of basic expenses like your mortgage, like your rent saved up and put away in cash that you can access immediately if something like this happens, um, that you need a repair to your home or you need some money for rent or your mortgage um, to make up the difference. Uh, Something does happen to you or your family uh, and you need some access to that because nobody wants to be put in a position when they're emotionally struck with grief or with a big change in their life um, and they need to have access to money and cash, or they just need to take a little bit of time out from their job to deal with something else. And that's why, you know, having three months to give you a little bit of leeway there is really, really important. That's an unfortunate situation. And, you know, uh, being that age, I would hope that other people wouldn't have to experience it. But the reality of the situation is unexpected things like that happen all the time. So it's important to be prepared for the unexpected. And that was great advice in terms of having at least three months of savings, because whether it's a job loss or emergency repair to your roof, it, you really need that extra money. Otherwise, you'll have to go into debt to pay for something like that. Like last year, I had my roof suddenly destroyed by the weather and I could have made a claim in my in terms of my insurance, but it just wasn't high enough. It was almost a thousand dollars worth of damage, but while the insurance wouldn't cover it, that was money out of my pocket. So I'm certainly happy that I did have those emergency savings and I was able to pay for them without going into debt. So great advice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, last thing you want to do when you're already in any kind of situation, you know, stress wise from the event itself happening, like like damage to your roof from the weather or emotional stress from something else is then to be going into debt at 19%, 21%, whatever the interest rate is on your credit card to be then paying for it and then seeing that interest rate and the interest expense, the expenses of that going up and up every month because you're not paying it off. I mean, that on top of everything else you're already dealing with is just not the route you want to go down. Obviously, you were dealing with a lot And it certainly helps to have a second unbiased opinion and have people there to support you. So can you tell us about 
some of the people that help guide you in your decision making process during this difficult time? Well, you know, lucky for me, and I talk about this in my book about how in my 20s, a big part of building a, a dream team, I call them, of professionals is what's so important and going through a whole bunch of different experiences in purchasing real estate and real estate investing and working with people in real estate. Part of the work that I've done at Blackhawk Financial has been doing marketing for real estate developers and um, not just in that field, but other fields and in my own investing is building this dream team of professionals in their different industries that can help you and not even just professionals, but just personal people in your support circle that you trust to give you guidance that know you well. Um, and so people that helped guide my decision through this process from the personal perspective and the professional perspective was, you know, my uncle for one, he's a, a, a commercial and residential real estate developer and investor of decades. And um, so I really trust his opinion in terms of, you know, where he saw the market going in terms of rentals and um, detached and attached homes and sales and um, where he saw that going and what he saw happening. And he said something that was very poignant and I, I really took this to home. And he said that in terms of a, a real estate investment, the backstop to it is if the market goes down, your backstop is that as an investment, you can always live in the property. So if you're losing money, you can always go there and live there. And that's the value and you can always live in the place. But if you're so emotionally withdrawn from this neighborhood and you don't want to be there, you don't even want to go there. But I didn't even want to visit this place. I was like, you know, begging my mom or somebody else to go move stuff out of that place or like, just get me the heck out of there. I didn't even want to be there. And it's far and wide. It's the absolute best neighborhood in downtown Vancouver, uh, the most expensive neighborhood. <laughs> and I didn't want to go there for 10 minutes for months. And it was just sitting there empty. And um, he said, if you don't want to live there at the end of the day ever again, then you should sell it. Because if it goes down in value and you can't get anyone to live there, you don't, you know, you're not going to make money off it. That's a bad investment and you should sell it because you're, yeah, your backstop as an investment is that you can always live in it. Um, so that was his opinion. And, you know, he also felt that the market was probably going to go down over the next couple of years. So I turned to him firstly, also because he's my family and he cares about me emotionally. I also have a wonderful mortgage broker. I turned to her, my realtors, um, who was a, a referral through my uncle. He's worked with them a lot. They also have known me since I was a child um, through my uncle. My accountant, I also turned to him in terms of taxation and what that would look like for me um, because I wanted to know the consequences of that before I ventured into selling this because I wanted to know how much money I would owe in tax. So that's also really important to look at before you're considering selling a home or an investment property. Um, close family members and friends who knew that I was grief stricken and I wanted to make sure that I was able to make a clear decision. So I kind of turned to them like very, very close family and friends to see, you know, what they thought. But ultimately at the end of the day, I feel like I have a very clear head about making business decisions versus personal decisions most of the time. So I made a pretty quick decision. I think it was within 10 days following me getting back to Vancouver from being traveling and finding out, you know, what had happened. And uh, I made the decision, listed it for sale. And, you know, it took a few months for it all to come together, but it happened. But those were, you know, the main people, my uncle, my mortgage broker, my realtor, my accountant, close family and friends. But yeah, I mean, when you think about making all these decisions, no matter what your personal situation is, there's a lot of people that you really should be asking for their opinion. You also might have to bring a lawyer in, depending on what your situation is, if you're married or if you're getting divorced, if that's part of your, your reason for selling a home. I own this home 100% independently um, by myself, so there was nobody else I had to have involved in that way legally. But yeah, there's a lot of professionals that you should be asking when you're considering selling a home. That's a really great advice. And further to that, with these individuals, I think it really helps to have your team of trusted individuals organized in advance because, for example, if you're looking at properties and you make an offer and it's accepted and you don't even have a home inspector or a real estate lawyer lined up, then you'll find yourself scrambling and you might settle for somebody who is available as opposed to somebody who's 
really an expert and will give you that great level of service. As they say, hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, I would say it's a good idea when you're even thinking about buying a property to assemble your dream team so that those individuals are there for you when you need them and perhaps even get like a backup home inspector, backup real estate lawyer, because you never know if they might be away on vacation or be unavailable during that time. And yeah, even as a landlord, it's good to have, you know, handy people to help you out, whether it's a pipe bursting or, you know, your roof getting destroyed like me. So if you want to be successful as a homeowner or or landlord, it it helps a lot to have these trusted individuals that you can call on whenever you need them. Mm -hmm. And usually the, all these kind of people um, that are on your, your dream team, they usually have the right kind of referrals to the other people that you'll need and they'll know the price points that they charge and they'll know the range of the price points that they charge. And sometimes they'll know one, like for example, my realtor knew a notary to be able to do the closing paperwork for the sale. But that notary, that notary was actually twice the price of the notary that I used initially to buy the property like nine years ago. That notary was half the price. So I actually already had someone on my dream team from nine years ago from when I was 21, that was way cheaper um, that you would have never thought. But so not, not necessarily the referrals are always the right price or the best. So you sometimes have to dig around, but um, usually referrals are a great way to go. I often trust the other people that are in my network and you can ask mentors. That's why I'm also such a big believer in having mentors and people that you can trust in your personal network because you can use them to help guide you in the right direction for the people that will help you and give you the good the good advice that you need that you're just simply not an expert in i'm i'm such a believer in that i will never say that i know something i don't know and i will always ask questions because i don't know a lot of things <laughs> and i am happy to ask questions and i am also happy to pay someone to do the work that I am not an expert in because I want it done right. And I'm happy to pay someone for their expertise to do that. A great point. I could probably try to rewire my entire house, but <laughs> then if I turned on the light switch, it would probably burn down. So certainly uh, recommend, you know, leaving it to the experts like that. And you might hurt yourself too, Sean. We don't want that. Exactly. <laughs> great. So I've kind of led us up to this point in your story of making your decision to sell the property. So can you tell me a bit about how you made your ultimate decision of selling the property? So looking at all the factors, I sort of made a, you know, a pluses and a minuses, pros and cons list on paper and in my head and really went with my gut as well. And looking at all the factors, how everything from taxation to what the market I felt was going to do. And, you know, the real estate markets like the stock market, nobody can time the market. Nobody has a crystal ball. But with what's going on Canada-wide with these international buyer taxes, with um, regulation of Airbnbs and vacation homes and the furnished rental market, how there's a lot of um, new furnished rentals coming onto the market, um, how I was going to be moving and I wanted to be in a, a fresh start and a new place with my life personally. I thought the best thing to do was take the gains that I had made over my 20s and get a fresh start somewhere else, take that money and invest it in something new. And ultimately it all worked out. I really just had to do my research, make a clear decision in my head, look at all the different angles. And I really... I, the only way to make that decision was by talking to all of those different people in their different areas of expertise. Because every single time I talked to one other person, they brought up a very good point that I would have never thought of because I am not in that field. And, you know, every time when I talked to my accountant or the realtor or a mortgage broker, like, you know, about, oh, you could transfer the mortgage or, oh, the, the realtor says, well, you know, what about this? You could rent it out this way instead, or you could buy a, another rental property. You could buy two rental properties with that money in another area that's cheaper because right now you're owning in the most expensive price per square foot area in the entire country. So there's all these people giving you all these other ideas and thoughts that you never thought of before. So really making that ultimate decision, you can't make it until you talk to those people that help you and guide you to make it. You have to go through the right steps, but I'm glad that I made the decision that I did. 
No, that's great to hear. And yeah, certainly I recommend getting the perspectives of many people because for most people, this is the single biggest financial decision of their lifetime. So I certainly think that it makes sense to speak to these individuals. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, once you gather the information, it's important to make the final decision that's best for yourself because I would think these people are, are sharing their expertise, but I guess everyone kind of has a bit of a bias. So you have to really learn to read through that and, and look at um, what the final decision would be that's best for yourself and look out for yourself because you're the person who cares about your money the most. So it's important to, you know, look out for your financial well-being first and foremost. Yeah. And you know, that's the other thing too about working with, again, what I call my dream team is all of these people that I had been working with. Uh, This wasn't the first time I had worked with any of them. All of them had been working with me for years and had known me for years. And so I had already trusted all of them. So it wasn't my first point of contact. And, um, you know, that's what feels really comforting, especially when you're already going through something that was so um, earth shattering. And, you know, I was already in a place that was very uncomfortable and having those people on my side and giving me the right guidance just made me feel that much more comfortable in my decision-making. So I'm so lucky to have had and still have, I still, of course, (laughs) am friends with and, you know, work with them all. And I'm so lucky to have them. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really pleased with how it all turned out. Okay. And I mean, certainly I think any trusted professional should give you fair advice. It may not make sense to work together right now, but if you give somebody unbiased advice and tell them the truth and let them make their own decision, then the person's really going to appreciate that honesty. And if you don't do business right away, then that's fine. But then perhaps you might do business later on because the person appreciates your honesty or they might refer other people to you. So yeah, I mean, I think that's the right way to do business in my opinion. And those are the kind of people that you want on your real estate dream team. Yeah, definitely. Just finishing up the story here, can you tell us how did your first sales process go in So again, I would definitely say that the selling process is way easier than buying. When I actually bought the apartment, I think I made 13 offers and this was either the 13th or the 14th offer that got accepted. (laughs) This one that I'm now selling or that I just sold, uh, it ended up taking three months uh, to get one offer and it finally, I took where I think this was the second offer and we accepted or I accepted and um, it ended up closing. Um, The market in Vancouver had slowed down in in the condo market throughout the summer. And, you know, if I had listed it for in, you know, a couple months earlier in April or so, I would have gotten by what the comps had showed about $50,000 more which, you know, is frustrating. But again, you can't time life clearly and you can't time the market and stocks or real estate or any kind of investment. So, you know, that's just the way that life goes. And um, I'm still really pleased with the experience. I'm really pleased with the way that my first home buying experience has gone and my first sale. And I don't have any regrets. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy about it overall. No, that's uh, great to hear. And certainly, you know, in terms of when you buy another property, I think you have some great lessons uh, so that you'll be an even smarter real estate investor going forward. Well, I sure hope so, Sean. <laughs> great. Well, Leanna, it's been wonderful having you on the show today. Before I let you go, is there anything of interest that you're working on that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, I would love if everyone would go check out my book, Young, Fun, and Financially Free. It's available on Amazon. And all the proceeds of the book go to the We Charity, which supports people in international uh, developing countries. And they build villages for them. And the proceeds of the book go to the Opportunities Pillar of the We Charity, which supports the income and economies of the village once they're built. And of course, that's to remind people that in in so many different third world countries all over the world. There are hundreds of millions of people that don't have the opportunities that we do here living in Canada or other Western civilized countries and that you have the opportunity here to make your real estate dreams or any other dreams come true. And by buying the book, 
you can give a little bit back to those who will never have the opportunity that you do here. And I also have a really interesting feature about myself and it's going to be published sometime near after uh, International Women's Day. It's with a contemporary women's wear brand out of Los Angeles called Jing. And it's going to be a really great uh, video and photo feature about some great women in interesting industries changing up the world. And obviously mine's about uh, women in finance. So I will be posting about that soon on my Instagram, which is Leanna underscore Hawk, H-A-W-K. Not to be confused with my last name, Hawkins, <laughs> but Hawk was my nickname or is my nickname in the financial world. <laughs> And um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Leanna Blackhawk. Great. And I'll be sure to include all of that in the show notes. And it's great that you're supporting such wonderful causes as well. Thanks again for being on the podcast. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you, Sean. It was great talking to you about real estate today. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Burn Your Mortgage podcast. Besides being a podcast host, I'm also an independent mortgage broker. If you or anyone you know, family, friends, co-workers, or neighbors could ever use any unbiased mortgage advice or a second opinion, feel free to reach out. Email me at sean, that's S-E-A-N, at burnyourmortgage.ca or call or text me at 647-867-3711. For a free mortgage consultation. Also, be sure to head on over to www.burnyourmortgage.ca and sign up for my free weekly newsletter. As a small token of my appreciation, you'll be able to download my ultimate mortgage checklist on choosing the perfect mortgage. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you with all your mortgage needs. Once again, Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. Until next time, happy mortgage burning. <laughs>